Eccellenza reverendissima, Monsignori, ladies and gentlemen, my friends. After this introduction, I am deeply uh, in trouble because I can only be a delusion to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Please, um, don't, uh, don't take it too badly. Um, I was asked to speak about the political practice of Carol Wojtyła and St. Thomas Aquinas. In the first part of this paper, uh, I am give, trying to give you an idea of what was the first encounter of, of Carol Wojtyła with uh, the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. The general atmosphere, the presuppositions, the kind, the quality of the Thomas, of this young student coming from Poland, far away, which some in Europe consider a little bit too far east, a little bit barbarian, but that, as a matter of fact, has a tremendous uh, uh, culture, great literature, extraordinary poets, and so forth. In the second part, we will um, try to see how uh, this Thomism has had an effect upon the teaching, and especially the teaching that has, been, uh, that has had a political impact of John Paul II. Um, as far as I know, um, the first philosophical book uh, which he was studied when he was a student was uh, a, a handbook of Kazimierz Schweiss, Ontologia Chili Metaphysica Ogulna. I say it in Polish because I know that among you there is at least one scholar of Polish descent. Uh, that means um, ontolo uh, ontology, that is uh, general metaphysics. Uh, Kazimierz Weiss um, was a rigorous Thomist, a strong Thomist. But if, if you consider his times, he was rather open to uh, uh, the relation to uh, other philosophies. Um, he had the effect, stood under the influence of the so-called school of Louvain. Uh, and uh, his book is written in a very difficult language, very technical. Um, it is not a, a book with which uh, students can easily fall in love. In the beginning, poor Wojtyla was desperate. For two weeks, he broke his head trying to make a sense out of this book uh, without effects. So if you are a student, and if your first approach to Thomist metaphysics is a difficult one, well, don't worry. Sooner or later, you will come to, uh, to understand uh, what it is. Um, uh, but after a couple of weeks, Wojtyla was fascinated. At the beginning, metaphysics seemed to be far from immediate experience, dry, dull. But, uh, um, but after a while, you understand that in metaphysics, you enter into the realm of abstractions. You put within brackets the real existing world. And within the real existing world, all the things you are really interested in too. Uh, but uh, what you put within brackets does not go lost, uh, is not left forever. And putting it within brackets, you gain a capacity of reading more deeply into, uh, the, uh, uh, into reality. When you have gathered through metaphysics a better understanding of the general structure of reality, then you go back to all the things that are so interesting to you. And you can love them much more and understand them much better. Um, here is the beginning. Wojtyla was scarcely 20 years old, um, and he was in the underground seminary of the, of the Diocese of Krakow, uh, an underground seminary uh, created, protected, and defended by a, gra a great prince of the church, Cardinal Sapieha. Uh, this first introduction was then completed uh, by uh, the, uh, the Angelicum in Rome were uh, uh, studied under great masters of Polish Thomist thought, like Garigula Grange and De Finance. Shall we say then that Wojtyla was a Thomist, only a Thomist, just a Thomist, since the beginning to the end? Not quite. Uh, the young man who uh, uh, goes to the Angelicum has already 
a certain experience, if not of philosophy, at least uh, of uh, literature. He was a great reader of the great poets of Polish Romanticism, Słowacki, Krasinski, Mickiewicz, and first of all, uh, Camille Cyprian Norwood. All these poets are poets, but are philosophers at the same time. Uh, and uh, you find in them a kind of uh, philosophy of the history of the Polish nation, of the nations in general, and of the Polish nation, that was formulated um, through uh, a, a meditation on uh, the terrible history of Poland, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, with intellectual means coming from um, French Romanticism uh, and uh, from you tra can trace back uh, their concepts to uh, Giovanni Battista Vico in the Italian philosophy and to Bossuet in France through the mediation of Balance, who was well known to the Polish emigration. Um, these great poets had already uh, also a national tradition. They were influenced by the French and the Italians, but they had a national tradition. Uh, 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 seeing the history of the Polish nation as a calling of God to the Polish people manifested through the baptism of the nation. And this story is a story made of um, the, uh, the response of the Polish people who has been unfaithful, faithful and unfaithful to the calling. Unfaithful mainly because of the selfish greed of the ruling classes. Uh, but every time they have gone back. Uh, through repentance and conversion and through the faith of the humble. I recall here the great name of Piotr Skarga and the significance of the popular devotion to the Black Virgin and Mother of Jasna Gura, a political devotion. She is the Queen of Poland, especially in periods in which Poland had no king and no queen of this earth. In the years of the partition of Poland, this vision consolidates in the idea of odrugenie, uh, national revival, that is very similar also to uh, what was developed in, Italia, in, in Italy by Rosmini and Gioberti. Um, the nation had been humiliated and divided, had disappeared from the geographical map of Europe. Nevertheless, she would be resurrected through a moral and spiritual renewal, a religious conversion. These elements are common stock of all great Polish Romantic poets. But the one that Wojtyła loved most of all, uh, Camille Cyprian Norwood, imposes to this philosophy of history a forceful twist. The, the resurrection of the nation is not something that will take place someday in the future. The resurrection happens every day in the lives of the individuals and of families. Uh, Norwood uh, sees clearly the risk of a reduction of Polish Christian conscience to a kind of national messianism. There was Toviansky who really uh, developed a national messianism. And he makes a clear cut distinction between Polish history and the history of salvation. Um, the history of salvation and Polish history are connected, but they are not one and the same. To Toviansky, Poland was a kind of Christ of nations in a very concrete sense of the word. But, poly, but um, uh, history of salvation and uh, general history cannot be reduced to one another. After many years, we will find this idea again in the great homily of John Paul II uh, pronounced in uh, Oswiecim, which we in the West call Auschwitz, uh, in his first pilgrimage in Poland. Here he explains the meaning uh, of the offering of his life by Maximilian Kolbe. And here he makes a strong distinction, just in the sense of Norwood, between worldly success and spiritual victory. Uh, in the moment in which the Polish nation experiences the utmost humiliation and defeat in the realm of military and political power, Father Kolbe wins through the sacrifice of his life to save the life of another fellow prisoner, a spiritual victory similar to that of Christ himself. Now, we have already this rich uh, literary, but at a certain extent also philosophical uh, uh, experience. The second experience that shapes uh, the intellectual consciousness of young Wojtyla is that of the reading of uh, 
uh, the great mystics, and especially of the mystics of the Carmelite tradi tradition, led by a saintly tailor of Krakow, who was his friend, Jan Tiranowski. Here, the main issue is the presence of God in the soul of man. And a vision of conscience that sees human conscience as a dialogue, the seat of a dialogue, with that presence of God. Uh, uh, and here also, again, we have the mystics, but in particular, St. John of the Cross, because of a decisive clarification offered by St. John of the Cross. Um, the presence of God, uh, uh, how can God be present uh, uh, in human conscience? Well, the presence of God is at the same time an absence. It is the presence of an absence. And the presence of an absence is a sign. Take a footpath. Uh, the footpath tells you that, that there is a foot, and the foot is not here. So the sign of God and the soul of man uh, could become the beginning of a kind of pantheism, which St. John of the Cross excludes. It is the sign uh, of God. The presence of God is the sign of God. And then uh, this sign sets uh, the heart of man in motion to search for the original of, of that image, the image of God and the soul of man. And this search becomes the hermeneutic criterion that helps us to read and to understand the history of each human individual person, of the nations and of the individuals. We will see later there are two sides of the same coin. Uh, in Christ, who is God who moves towards the searching man because he wants to be found, history becomes history of salvation. You have a movement going from man to God, uh, which uh, uh, is started by man, and there is a, a, a movement going from God to man, a catechesis, a movement going from up to, to down. Now it is apparent that when young Wojtyla um, enters into the Angelicum, or rather into the seminar, um, he carries in his heart uh, a, a, a set of, of questions and of evidences. Um, and the original source of these questions can be sought even deeper than the level of these first very important readings. Uh, can be f found in the precautionary experience of grief for the death of the mother. Uh, and also, uh, it is uh, engendered uh, out of the sorrow for the destiny of the nation. There was the dark night of Nazi occupation. Millions of Polish people uh, were brutally slaughtered. Uh, and later, National Socialism was defeated. But what arrived was not freedom, but another totalitarian dictature, that of communism. This is the state of mind of young Wojtyla entering into uh, the Angelicum. Which kind of Angelicum finds Wojtyla? What was the situation there? Well, um, when Wojtyla goes to the Angelicum, the indisputed master of Thomist studies was Father Garigou Lagrange. And Father Garigou Lagrange was convinced of the necessity to defend objective truth against modern subjectivism and against the nouvelle theologie, the new theology. Uh, this, new, this expression, new theology, was found by Garigou Lagrange himself in a, an article that began the famous confrontation of the new theology. La nouvelle theologie, où va-t-elle? What is uh, the new theology uh, heading for? Uh, the Roman theological environment, however, was not homogeneous. There was Garigou de Lagrange, the undisputed master, uh, but there was also Father Joseph de Finance. Already the title of the book of de Finance, Etre et Agir dans la philosophie de Saint Thomas, uh, 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 being and action in the philosophy of Saint Thomas, uh, shows his attention for the issue of action. Uh, and tries not to oppose being to action, objectivity to subjectivity, but rather to put them in relation to one another. And by the way, Garigou Lagrange was uh, uh, not uh, only that watchdog of Roman orthodoxy that is uh, uh, 
uh, represented sometimes. It is a little bit of caricature. He was a man of great philosophical interest and a great mind. Um, but however, there is a confrontation. On the one hand, those who defend the rights of truth, objective truth. On the other hand, those who mm, see the issue of the human subject, subjectivity, and they are suspected of relativism, sometimes not without good reasons. Um, uh, it was the debate on modernism. Um, let me quote here uh, um, uh, a great Dominican whom I have met when I was a young man. He was Father Ceslao Pera. I don't know whether he is uh, uh, known in the States. He uh, edited, among other things, the De Cielo et Mundo of St. Uh, Thomas. Of St. Thomas? Well, let's, he says of St. Thomas, so uh, we believe him, although there have been doubts on the authorship. Uh, and uh, uh, when I was a young man in Torino, there was still the remembrance of this man who, in order to better understand St. Thomas Aquinas, had transformed himself in a man of the, of the 13th century. Uh, you cannot, well, you can up to a certain extent, you must. At the same time, you cannot cease being a man of your time. Um, and then uh, within the broad movement uh, that we may call uh, La Nouvelle Theologie, you can, you must make a distinction between two different stances. The first one wants to participate in the research of modern man, wants to accept the starting point, the existential starting point of modern man, and also the philosophical categories in which this existential starting point has been formulated. If we go along this path to its very end, then the truth of the faith has to be reduced within the comprehension of the modern man. And this was the way of modernism condemned by Pius X. Christian faith is reduced within the transcendental horizon of the modern man. And what cannot stand within that horizon then has to be left uh, and abandoned. There is, however, also the possibility of a different path. Uh, and really, uh, what uh, uh, Henri de Lubac wanted, Henri de Lubac was the great opponent of uh, of uh, Garrigou Lagrange, uh, the article uh, uh, La Théologie Nouvelle, où uh, 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 was written against uh, uh, Derubac. And what Derubac wanted, and what instinctively also um, the young Wojtyla wants, um, is to accept the existential starting point of modern man, but not the philosophical categories in which uh, modern philosophers has expressed this existential situation and to accept the existential starting point of modern man not as a point of arrival that cannot be transcended but rather as a problem and a question whose adequate answer is only the encounter with Christian faith. In this sense modernity is not an horizon. Um, the existential experience of, of modern man must not be accepted at face value in the categories in which it formulates itself, but must be rather be critically reformulated. We can do this because we are modern men too. The intent is to be an inroad into modernity leading to Christian faith. Faith is considered as a force capable of transcending the limits of the usual interpretation of modernity. Um, I remember now uh, a sentence of Ansul von Balthasar. Um, uh, Gottes Wort sprengt Grenzen, Gottes Wort schafft Zukunft. Uh, the word of God uh, breaks uh, the borders, the limits. The word of God creates future. The word of God. You stay in, in the situation of the modern man with the word of God that transcends the situation. Um, the act of trespassing this transcendental limit towards Christian faith is intertwined with an analogous trespassing 
of the same limit in the direction of philosophical truth that allows us to better formulate a theoretical understanding both of truth in itself and of the true existential situation of the man of our time, not adequately recognized in the so-called philosophy of modernity. This second stance implies a critical sympathy with modernity. A sympathy, but critical, a critical sympathy. Christianity does not reconcile itself with the denominating self-comprehension of modernity, but helps modernity to reach beyond itself, or rather, beyond the self-imposed limit towards its true and better self. We are not modernists, still we are modern men. Um, there is one truth, but many paths leading to truth. And each man, in one sense, needs his own path, has to, uh, to, to move towards truth. Um, and because of, just because of its eternity, truth enlightens a plurality of contingent situations and is conquered anew in the critical confrontation and dialogue with modernity. And at the end, uh, truth will be the same, it is eternal, and at the same time different, enriched through this confrontation and dialogue. Enriched the, the truth, not. Enriched our comprehension of truth. Um, for what you it is only natural to adopt this vision, and that can be seen as an opposition, but also as a continuation of the position of Garrigou Lagrange. What will be then the quality of the Thomism? St. Thomas cannot be just a starting point. He is rather a point of arrival. We move from the existential situation towards St. Thomas and uh, a, a compass. It is difficult to reach this point of arrival if it is not present somehow since the beginning. And here we are reminded of the profound meaning of uh, the title Doctor Communis, with which St. Thomas is designated. This title really characterizes the role of St. Thomas in the history of Christian theology and philosophy. The Doctor Communis is not opposed to any particular school, to any particular uh, existential human situation. Uh, he is rather a landmark that averts the absolutization of any particular perspective and prevents its circling back on itself and it's, and it's becoming isolated from other expressions of the same truth. You all remember, I, I am sure, um, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, who, by the way, has written a, a biography of St. Thomas that has received the unqualified approval of Etienne Gilson, and who says that uh, the error is a truth that has become insane, that opposes itself to other truths instead of looking passionately for its proper place in the organism of complete truth. In this sense, Thomism is not just a philosophical theological school among others, but a common compass forbidding the self-absolutization of partial perspective. It guarantees the orthodoxy, the correct doctrine, and the Catholicity, the openness of the totality of truth and in the totality of truth to dialogue with other perspectives. Philosophy and theology in this, in, in this vision um, are a, a doctrine, but are also an activity. Why do we make philosophy? Is it, no, is it not enough to repeat what has already been said by St. Thomas Aquinas? No, because we must find the truth, toward the, 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 the path towards the truth, starting from the place in which we are. And this process is existential and historical, goes from the contingent to the eternal. So young Wotiwa, when he encounters St. Thomas, is charged with these demands and expectations of his generation, to which he intensely participates. These demands uh, must be put for a while within brackets in order to learn the method of metaphysics, but they will forcefully reemerge later and will more easily find an answer just because in the beginning they have been put within brackets. Um, the study of theology at the Angelicum will be followed by the study of philosophy at the Jagiellonian University of Krakow. Uh, the philosophical environment of Krakow was then impregnated with the realistic phenomenology of Roman Ingarden. Ingarden, Ingarden had been one of the first followers of Edmund Husserl, but had refused the transcendental turn of his master and had further developed his 
thought towards realism, along a path similar to that of his friend, Edith Stein. Uh, the doctoral thesis of Wojtyla in philosophy was dedicated to the problem of the possibility of constituting uh, a, a Christian ethics, of constructing a Christian ethics on the basis of the phenomenology of Max Scheler. Uh, there were many similar theses uh, in all Catholic universities uh, uh, in that period. And as a rule, these theses are very similar to one another. You make a comparison between the philosopher and uh, Thomism, and you explain uh, where the philosopher is wrong. Um, uh, to a certain extent, also what you does this, but uh, there are significant differences because uh, it, 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 it tries to reformulate uh, the phenomenology of Schiller. Not just to say it is wrong, but it tries to reformulate in order to make, make it nearer to truth. To and the answer could be the phenomenology of Schiller is not adequate to formulate Christian ethics, but we could reformulate phenomenology in such a way that it would become adequate for the formulation of Christian ethics. So the dialogue with St. Thomas has not as a result uh, a kind of condemnation of the philosopher, but uh, a step forward towards truth, uh, taking into consideration the existential stance, the standpoint of the philosopher, in this case of Max Schiller. Uh, the point of arrival of this process can be found in uh, uh, the book of Wojtyla, Love and the Responsibility, 1960. I have seen some copies of this book here. I'm glad to see that it is read. Uh, it is not an handbook for uh, young people uh, just uh, considering the possibility of getting married. It may be read also in this way, and it is useful also in this reading, but uh, uh, um, it is not just that. It is something more. It is an important work of philosophy. Uh, uh, not by chance it attracted the attention of Henri de Lubac, who wrote a French introduction to the French edition of, the, of this book. In, in, uh, in the first two pages of this book, uh, Oitiwa gives us uh, an important methodology. He begins with the observation that the world is made of objects. Uh, but immediately after this sentence, he adds, well, we could also start saying that the world is made of subjects. And subjects are much more interesting than objects, no doubt. Um, we, however, begin with saying that the world is made of objects, because subjects are objects. That is, uh, the human subject uh, has an objective structure. I am not what I would like to be. I am not what I imagine to be. I am what I am. The fundamental structure of the human being is uh, given. And only if we remain conscious of this, we can make a philosophy of the subject without falling prey to subjectivism. That is the hypostatization of the discovery of the subject. Um, my essential characteristics are not the result of a process of self-constitution but rather of an original gift of being that I received from another subject, from my parents directly, and in the last instance by God himself. Uh, but I am also the result of a process of self-constitution. Um, through my efforts, I became one man, and my, I might have begun an, another man. Uh, uh, on the basis of the original gift of being given by God, each one has the responsibility of what he has become. Uh, a man uh, can become a, white, a weightlifter or a dancer. Um, but this effort at self-creation is only possible on the basis of the fact that God has created me, making of me a man. Only men can become either weightlifters or dancers, or philosophers, or many other things. Uh, after this fundamental methodological clarification, Wojtyla goes on considering the human subject. Uh, and his issue is human subjectivity. If modernity is the thought of the subject and the discovery of human subjectivity, then the approach of Wojtyla is surely modern. But the subject of Wojtyla is not 
the subject of the cogito of Descartes. Um, Sister Allen would not be at home within the limits of the subject of Descartes, whilst she seems to be perfectly at home within the limits of the subject of Wojtyla. Among other things, because the subject of Wojtyla, who has an objective structure, has a body. And this body is a sex-suited body, male or female, is situated in time and space as a father and a mother, is within a nation, as an history, and so forth. Um, to Garrigou Lagrange, and first of all, to St. Thomas Aquinas, ancest illud quod primo cadit in cognizione humana, uh, being as what uh, first of all uh, enters into uh, the human cognition. To Wojtyla, in a certain sense, primo quod cadit in intenzione, in cognizione umana, est homo. The first thing uh, that uh, uh, falls within uh, the attention of man is man himself. Rather, another man. What is the first object we become conscious of? Our mother. Uh, we enter into the world of being, entering into relation with this particular being that is another human being, uh, our mother. The father comes later. Um, man is a subject with at the same time an object, an ends. It is as if uh, Wojtyla uh, begins with the prima secunde of the Summa Theologiae, with the treatise uh, De Homine. Um, the all ontological wealth of the pars prima is progressively recovered uh, in the progress of the argument. And this can be easily done because, as in the treatise De Homine of St. Thomas, the man who stands in the beginning is a really existing man, a being. Um, phenomenology helps to disentangle the intricacies of human experience and leads, up, and leads us up to the fundamental questions that properly belong to the realm of metaphysics. Metaphysics, for its part, helps phenomenology not to get lost in the mazes of its interpretations. Metaphysics allows us to see, in a certain sense, the fundamental frame and the skeleton of, of experience, while phenomenology shows us the tendons and muscles supporting, and su su rather supported by the skeleton. Together, they constitute the living body of philosophical experience. Um, if this is the first approach to Thomism, now we have, because of, of the short time that we have at our disposal, we must jump to uh, John Paul II, from the young Wojtyla, uh, a young philosopher, to uh, the political praxis of Karol Wojtyla. Um, well, it is a matter of course that John Paul II did not make politics and that not a political praxis in the usual sense of the word. But in another sense, he had. Uh, in Laborium Exercise, he himself makes the distinction between um, uh, different meanings of politics. Politics is the struggle for power, to gain and maintain power. And he does not participate in this game. But uh, uh, politics is also uh, the uh, preoccupation for the common good. And of this preoccupation, of course, he participates. Um, the man who tells the truth does not enter into the political game. But the witness given to truth produces political effects that sometimes can be even revolutionary. Um, in his uh, message on occasion of the 13th World Peace Day, John Paul II explains that man is an essentially moral being. On the footsteps of St. Thomas, he says that when man performs an evil act, he does it and needs to justify it in front of his own conscience with the intention of a certain good. <clears throat> so the use of violence is, is disguised with the pretext of a reaction or a defense against the violence of your opponent. A witness given to truth without violence respecting under all circumstances the human dignity of the opponent, who is never an enemy, if need be up to martyrdom, disarms violence. 
the respect for human dignity goes hand in hand with an appeal to the conscience of the opponent whose dignity as a moral subject is affirmed. Well, uh, you find here, in one sense, the methodology of all what has taken place in Poland in uh, uh, the period between uh, August 1980 and 1981, the collapse of communism. The communitarian witness of the people of God under the spiritual leadership of John Paul II animated the resistance to violence of all nations against uh, the totalitarian rule of communism. But you find the same methodology uh, against the national security dictatorships in Latin America and other forms of political oppression and violation of human rights in different parts of Asia and Africa. The appeal to the conscience of the opponent without making use of violence. I remember that once I, I, uh, I was talking to John Paul II and uh, 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 joking, I said, but your sanctity, your holiness, communists do not have a conscience. <laughs> he laughed and said, we will see. And <laughs> God's providence has put on his path at least two communists who had a conscience, many more, but two, uh, at least, Gorbachev and Jaruzelski. In the end, even Jaruzelski had their conscience. It was not easy to arrive to this conscience, but it, he had. The core of the broad popular movement for human rights, to which in those years millions and millions of non-Christians also participated, was the conviction of the inviolable dignity of each human uh, individual person. On this uh, issue, St. Thomas contradicts his master Aristotle and teaches that homo ordinatur, hom, uh, that homo non ordinatur ad comunitatem politicam secundum se totum. If you are reading my text here, there is uh, a, an error. Uh, not an error of St. Thomas, an error of, uh, of my typewriting. Homo non ordinatur ad comunitatem politicam secundum se totum. Man is not ordered to the political community according to the totality of himself. The Catechism of the Catholic Church has reformulated the same concept, and the Council of Vatican II, of course, uh, and said that the human person transcends the political community and constitutes, therefore, the end to which all political action should be oriented. Here, I must say that. Uh, um, if you look at the commentary of St. Thomas Aquinas to Aristotle, uh, uh, you find that he always follows uh, very, uh, very closely the text of Aristotle. And on this point, uh, he very bluntly says, well, as Aristotle says, and then he says the contrary of what Aristotle had said. <laughs> uh, there are two or three cases in, in which, uh, because he does not want to contradict the master. But on the other hand, uh, amicus Aristoteles said magis amica veritas. Um, from his phenomenological, tra from his phenom phenomenological training, John Paul II derives his capacity of beginning with the hic et nunc, the here and now of history, with the events that agitated the surface of human history, leading step by step the attention of the listener towards the fundamental structures that enliven in this history and towards the Son of God who stands in the center of cosmos and through his incarnation also of history. That is Redemptor Hominis, the first um, magnificent words of Redemptor Hominis. Phenomenological analysis is organically linked um, to uh, uh, metaphysical and also to theological reflection. The historical event does not lose at all his, its contingency and historicity, but is at the same time read and understood in the light of the history of salvation. Um, I think that this paper is too long to be read all, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps I should be finishing. Uh, I wish to say only a few words on another point. I wanted to talk to you about the role of culture and theology of nations, but I shall not do that. And uh, let us make another jump, this time from uh, John Paul II, uh, in a certain sense, to Pope Francis. Um, 
one other issue in which you see this methodology connecting the contingent and the, the eternal, reading a phenomenology of the contingent situation that brings, that is, uh, uh, so let us say, um, supported by uh, uh, the perception of the eternal structure uh, of man, uh, can be seen in the issue of liberation theology. In his first pilgrimage, John Paul II, after his elections, was to Latin America. Uh, and here uh, takes place the first confrontation and dialogue of the Pope with liberation theology. On the one hand, liberation theology is um, a great attempt at the enculturation of the faith in the culture of the Latin American people. This is the great, this is the great message of Puebla. Latin American theologians who want to speak of the Latin American man, they want to speak to the Latin American man and also of the Latin American man, and especially of the Latin American poor, taking him where he really is, that is, within his historically developed culture. This approach appears very much to the sensibility of John Paul II. It comes very close to his own theology of nations and to his way of speaking to the Polish people from within their history and their tradition. He is therefore sympathetic to the demand for a Latin American theology. The other side of liberation theology, however, is the use of Marxist analysis in order to explore the path of liberation. Some liberation theologians go even farther and make use of Marxist analysis also as an instrument to better understand the Latin American poor. John Paul II had already seen the failure of Marxism in his native Poland and could not have any illusions on the power of Marxism to liberate. As a consequence, the judgment on liberation theology had to be differentiated. The theology of the Latin American people had to be approved. The, existential, the existential situation of the, lit, of the Latin American poor must not, however, be understood on the basis of Marxist analysis. So we must accept the situation of the Latin American poor as a locus theologicus, uh, a starting point for the theological reflection. But um, it must not be a point of arrival. It must be interpreted on the basis of the gospel of Jesus Christ that is present in the culture of the Latin American poor since the first evangelization since the preaching of Bartolomé de las Casas, of Motolina, of Santo Toribio de Mongrovejo, and, first of all, since the event of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Here is also the justification and the, and the basis of a struggle for the liberation of the Latin American poor. It is perhaps uh, worthwhile to, rem to mention here that those who evangelized Latin America and defended the rights of the Indios were all disciples of St. Thomas, mainly through the mediation of Francisco de Vitoria. And here, the path of John Paul II crosses that of Pope Francis. A group of theologians and philosophers and sociologists that had begun to develop a kind of liberation theology, but it could perhaps better be called the theology of the people, Teologia del Pueblo in the sense desired by John Paul II, already before Puebla, uh, uh, had uh, been gathered around uh, some uh, important theological and philosophical personalities. They came mainly from the Cono Sur, the southern cone of Latin America, that is Argentina, Chile, Uruguay. I recall here the names of Jorge Maria Bergoglio. Uh, he was then uh, uh, the rector of San Miguel, uh, Lucio Hera, Juan Carlos Cannone, Guzman Carichiri, Alberto Metol Ferré, Joaquin Allende, Hernán Alessandri, Pedro Morandé, and others. They participated in the preparation of Puebla and in following struggles for a reorientation of liberation theology. Um, what is the key point? Uh, many, very often one uh, hears people saying, you cannot understand 
if you, not, if you do not consider the problem from within the situation, you cannot understand that the problems of Latin America if you don't uh, see them from within uh, Latin American culture and the existential situation of Latin America. That's true. Um, but it is, you listen also uh, to uh, a, a girl who is in love, or a, or a young boy who is in love, and who says, you cannot understand from the outside. You must understand from within. That's true. And that's false at the same time. Uh, all girls have friends. And when girls talk among themselves, very often, I don't know really. No, I do know because I have four daughters. Uh, but I th and, 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 and young men, uh, quite the same. They talk about, uh, young women talk about men. And young men talk about women. And talking to friends, you objectify what you are living. So that you see it not only from within, but also from without. Because there is an objective truth. And perhaps it is very difficult to see this truth from within your situation. But nevertheless, there is an objective truth. And uh, the help of somebody who sees it from without gives you the strength of seeing it yourself as it is really. So the situation of Latin America had to be seen from within and from without, from the point of view of, obj of objective truth uh, in order to determine what has to be done, but also from the point of view of the suffering within the situation in order to understand how it had to be done, how the truth could be explained and made a real possibility, uh, in the words of John Henry Cardinal Newman, for those who are in the situation. And liberation theology, well, uh, it changed. Well, some were confirmed, the Argentinians, the, uh, some, of, some of Chile, uh, of, of Uruguay, uh, some were condemned or condemned themselves through their actions. I think of the so-called revolution theology, uh, Pablo Richards, Hugo Hassmann, and some were corrected. Uh, the Brazilians, uh, most of them, and uh, Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, who, uh, who uh, succeeded in, in changing some of uh, some aspects of his uh, theology. Uh, and when he told, well, all what I have done uh, was correct. What was wrong in my theology was what I had learned in Europe, in Louvain and in Munich. <laughs> 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 and um, I remember uh, when the Pope went to uh, Peru. Uh, and one day, John Paul II went to pay a visit uh, to the last descendant of the Inca to show uh, his uh, um, respect for the dignity of this great uh, uh, historical culture. Uh, and perhaps 1,000 journalists were assembled in front of the home of Gustavo Gutierrez um, and wanted to ask him questions uh, and to bring him to say something against the Pope. Uh, uh, Gustavo Gutierrez is uh, also uh, an, an Indian, and he came out, he went to meet the journalists, and he said to them, uh, this is a great of joy for my people, a day of feast. Please, let me go to make feast with my people. Of other things, we will speak another day. And he left them there. <laughs> By the way, Gustavo Gutierrez became a Dominican. I don't know whether this has something to do with this, but perhaps it does. <laughs> um, it is not difficult to develop the issue of the rights of nations, and first of all, of the rights of the poor on the basis of the thought of St. Thomas. We must, however, recognize the fact that seldom or never it had been brought to evidence so forcefully as in the teaching of John Paul II. It is a classic example of a creative development on the basis of tradition. And it is also uh, a point on which, uh, in one sense, you can see how Pope Francis enters into the heritage of uh, uh, John Paul II. Um, I must stop here. I think I have no more time. Uh, if you read all of the paper, you could find other uh, exemplifications that help uh, to enter better into uh, the spirit of this um, uh, teaching 
in which uh, metaphysical truth as a landmark and as a compass. Phenomenological analysis, capacity of reading the culture of the people, entering into the culture of the people, uh, they, uh, become both instruments of uh, the witness given to the presence of Jesus Christ in the life of nations and in the life of each individual being. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy in saying that nobody has fallen asleep. <laughs>